On today's episode, model-based engineering will revolutionize aircraft production. Finally. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on engineering.com TV today. For such a high-tech enterprise, it can be surprising how slowly things move in aviation. For the US Air Force, training pilots to fly advanced jet aircraft, well, that's been largely built around the Northrop T-38, and that excellent aircraft has been flying for, incredibly, half a century. Now, jets are fast, but military procurement is slow, and good as it is, the T-38 probably should have been replaced two decades ago. With modern 4.5 and, and 5th generation military aircraft on the flight line, however, the need for an advanced trainer with modern systems simply forced the hands of Pentagon planners, and the winning team, Boeing and Saab, have produced a very useful looking airplane in the T-7A Red Hawk. The aircraft is capable, affordable, at least by military standards, and maintainable, and the USAF plans to buy some 350 of them. Now, by automotive standards, the industry I come from, numbers like that represent a Tuesday afternoon, but in the aerospace world, that's a multi-year production program and the unit costs reflect it. But cost reduction pressures are just as important in the aerospace industry as any other form of production engineering, and Boeing has turned to model-based engineering to get the Red Hawk off the drawing board and into production. Now, the challenge was simple, using the static test airframe. The rear fuselage assembly is built by Saab in Sweden, with the front built by Boeing St. Louis. Two different companies on two different continents building safety-critical major assemblies that must be mated under assembly line conditions. Now, normally we would expect to see lots of shimming and maybe some match drilling, but the two assemblies fit like Lego blocks, going together in 30 minutes, some 95% faster than industry standard. Now that's remarkable, and it's a quantum leap over even fully digital designs like Boeing's own 787 Dreamliner. Now, what model-based engineering does is take the same processes that were done before, namely design, static test article, fabrication and fitting, then redesign, and take it into the virtual realm. Now, the key factor is that the interaction of components, sub-assemblies, and assemblies are revealed at the software level, especially important with the high complexity of modern systems that make it almost impossible for humans to anticipate how they interact dynamically. Now, mistakes are still made, miscommunication between teams still exist, and vendor supplied components still deviate from nominal specifications. But now the hammering and cutting and swearing happens virtually, shortening the test and redesign cycle to minutes or hours instead of days and weeks. Living with a substandard part because the design is frozen is much less likely when an engineer can iterate 100 tweaks in the time it would take to prototype and fit check one. And there's a hidden benefit few talk about with advanced design systems like this, politics. Design changes are expensive, but they're really expensive when they involve complications like altitude and low temperature testing, fatigue failure testing, complex fabricated test articles, and of course, the specter of the FAA. Now, engineers are incentivized to think conservatively and color within the lines. But in the virtual world, you can do anything. Wonder if you can take half the weight out of that bracket? Well, just try it. Want to clamp that condensate line in four places instead of five? Well, excite the structure and see the bending modes in living color. Now, we talk a lot about additive manufacturing and generative design as breakthrough technologies in production engineering, but I think the real breakthrough is going to be not in how the design is automated, but how it allows designers to get creative and break things at essentially no cost. And in every engineering organization in which I've ever worked, no cost is always the right answer. Well, that's it for today's episode of End of the Line, brought to you by engineering.com. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell for our next episode. For our deeper engineering video series for the manufacturing professional, visit engineering.com TV to watch exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, not found here on our YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.